All right. How are you guys doing tonight? Good. I love seeing young people here. Thanks for being here, guys. Awesomeness. All right. So I'm going to challenge you tonight to grab a Bible because on Tuesday nights, we're going to jump right in to the Word. And uh, tonight, we've been working, if you haven't been here, it's your first time here, uh, we've been going through the book of 1 John. So if you want to turn over to 1 John, and we're over to chapter 2 tonight, which is awesome, because it's taken us a long time to get through chapter 1, but we're on to chapter 2 tonight. In fact, we're going to start tonight reading in John chapter 2, in verse 7, and we're going to read down to verse 14. So I'm going to read this to us tonight, and then we'll pray. And then we'll get into this Bible study, and then we'll do this for about a half hour, and then we'll spend some time praying tonight, all right? So if you've got things you want prayer for, we're going to bring it to the altar tonight, and I'm excited. That's my favorite part. All right, John, 1 John chapter 2, and let's look, starting in verse 7. John's writing, and he says, Dear friends, I am not writing you with a new command, but an old one, which you have had since the beginning. This old command is the message you have heard. Yet I am writing you a new command. Its truth is seen in him and you because the darkness is passing and the true light is already shining. Anyone who claims to be in the light but hates his brother is still in the darkness. Whoever loves his brother lives in the light and there is nothing in him to make him stumble. But whoever hates his brother is in the darkness and walks around in darkness. He does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded him. I write to you, dear children, because your sins have been forgiven on account of his name. I write to you, fathers, because you have known him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. I write to you, dear children, because you have known the Father. I write to you, fathers, because you have known him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you are strong, and the word of God lives in you, and you will overcome the evil one. All right, let's pray tonight, and then we'll get into this. God, I thank you for your word. I thank you for an opportunity to study and to dive uh, deep into what you are speaking to us tonight through your word. And first, John, I just pray that you will speak through me, and I pray that tonight as we pray together, God, and as we study your word together, that your Holy Spirit would be here and be with us and be near to us and teach us everything that you have for us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. 1 John chapter 2 is what we've been reading. And there is, if, if, you're, if, you're, if you're newer looking through the Bible, there's a book of John, and then there's 1 John. And the book of John actually was written by the same guy that wrote 1 John. John was a disciple of Christ. So I want to talk to us tonight on the idea out of this passage that the old impacts the new. All right? So I think sometimes in our lives, I was thinking about this today, that as soon as we experience something new in our lives... We throw out the old thing, right? Do you ever like get a new shirt? You get some new shoes? If you're like me, I, I, I have, I'm, I'm kind of weird, but I always have a pair of shoes for working in the yard, and then I have a pair of shoes for like, like tennis shoes, like working in the yard tennis shoes, and then like going grocery shopping tennis shoes, and then going to work out tennis shoes. My wife thinks I'm crazy. She has one pair for all three, but I cannot stand dirty shoes to be getting like dirty shoes like in the house or dirty shoes if I go to, I don't want people at Walmart to think I got dirty shoes, but then if I actually go out in public in those shoes, then they're all dirty again, so then I got to have a clean pair to wear when I'm at the gym. And my wife thinks I'm absolutely crazy. She don't understand. I'm a black man. Thank you, Miss Annette. Yes! <laughs> she don't understand. If she's watching online tonight, honey, you don't understand. Miss Annette says I'm a black man. Praise the Lord. Okay, so... Anyways, sometimes though when we get something new, whenever I get the new pair, immediately I go down to the next pair. It doesn't matter if the old pair, like my brother gave me a pair of new shoes and I had just gotten a new pair, but immediately the new pair I had just gotten became my old pair because I got a new pair. But there was nothing wrong with the old pair. And I think sometimes we do that with the Bible. Sometimes we get in the New Testament especially and we find all this this knowledge and so much of Jesus and what he's telling us, and we think, well, then that just discredits the Old Testament because everything that God did in the New Testament is more important than the Old Testament. But really, the Old Testament impacts the New Testament. 
I was thinking about it today in my life. I, I tell a lot of stories about growing up in church. Sometimes I tell stories about not even just growing up in church, but after I grew up and other church experiences I had that weren't so great. And I tell those stories usually because I know for most of us, we experience hard things in churches sometimes, and I want everyone to understand that even as a pastor, I, I have not just had a perfect experience in church, but I was thinking today, hold on one second, bud, okay? I was thinking today about the youth pastors that I had growing up, and my youth pastors were awesome, and they, I didn't realize then how much they lived like Christ in a world that was not living like Christ, and I don't mean that in a demeaning way to the rest of the world, but they exuded a love. I actually have told them, like after growing up and going back, that when I found God's house, I was always like, my youth pastors had the heart of God's house before I knew what God's house was. Like they just had this love for everyone. They also had a love for the word of God. And on Sunday nights, our youth pastor, Chris, did this class called Deep Dive. And we would go in and we would study books of the Bible together a lot like we're doing tonight. And I was thinking today about how the old impacts the new, that I was a 13, 14, 15 year old boy, which is almost 20 years ago now, sitting in a classroom, literally in my head thinking, why is it important that we're sitting here studying the book of the Bible? I just don't know why. And now almost 20 years later, I get to get on platforms and teach the same things that I was taught back then, because again, the old impacts the new. And so I think what's really cool about the passage of what John is writing here in 1 John chapter 2 is he says to them in verse 7, I'm writing to you a new, or not a new command, but an old one. And so whenever we're getting to study the Bible, uh, there's a few, few uh, questions that we as a church over the last year have learned from Megan Gilmore as she has uh, so awesomely taught us a lot of the word of God over the last year. And Megan always starts with three questions that we've kind of adapted as our three questions when we study. And the three questions, if you haven't heard them, the first one is what is the writer's intent? And then what is the context? And then how do we apply this to our modern day lives. And so I want to go through this a little bit uh, on what the writer's intent is in 1 John. And so if you're looking at 1 John, especially in chapter 2, and you say, okay, what is John's intent when he wrote this book? First off, the whole book, his intent was to, to share with us the love of God and what it really looks like to, like to live out a life of love. But in this section we're reading, he's trying to establish, number one, he starts in verse 7 and he says, dear friends, he's trying to establish that first off, when he's talking to us, he's talking to us as friends, not as some far off distant people who he doesn't care about. But he's like, man, hey guys, like you're my buds, you're my friends. I want to tell you this because I love you so much. That's one of his intents. The other intent is that he wants you to know that if you're going to be a follower of Christ, we're called to live in the light and not live in the darkness. And sometimes as believers and people who follow Christ, it's very easy to like raise our hand and receive Christ and be like, yes, I'm going to follow Jesus. But then the darkness comes back into our life and whatever the darkness looks like for you, and it pulls you back into the darkness. And so John's saying, look, not out of condemnation, not out of trying to be like, you need to be in the light, but more like, I have this love for you, my friends. I want to tell you that what I'm telling you, this isn't even new. This thing that I'm telling you, this new command I'm telling you, this is an old command. And so what is John writing, what context is John writing in in this point? John is writing to a people, the context he's writing to, that have seen Christ but haven't fully embraced him as God yet. There's people who have embraced him, but there's others in what would have been the church who said, Jesus was cool, he came into the world, he did miracles, but I don't know that he was actually the Messiah. And what John is saying to these people is, look, if you're going to embrace Christ as God and believe that he is actually fully God, then you have to know that he has embraced all of God and he is all of God. So if there's an old law and there's a new law, if there's an old covenant and a new co covenant, if there's an old command and a new command, it's all summed up in Christ. And so that's his intent coming into this chapter. And so as we go through here verse by verse, we're just going to pick apart how then do we apply it to our lives. So here we go. Chapter 2, verse 7, he says, Dear friends, I am not writing to you a new command, but an old one, which you have had since the beginning. All right, so get your Bibles ready because we're going to go around a lot in the Old Testament. Turn over to Exodus chapter 20 because he's talking to them about a command they've had from the beginning. And one of the first encounters 
where the people of God knew about a command God gave them was in Exodus chapter 20. And a lot of you guys have probably heard about the Ten Commandments. But sometimes when we hear about an old thing, it's easy to forget. So we're just going to read through Exodus chapter 20, starting in verse 1. You guys got it? Exodus 20, all right. And God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt and out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourselves an idol in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of their fathers to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but sowing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold or the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath to the Lord your God, and on it you shall not do any work. Neither you, nor your son or daughter, nor your manservant or maidservant, nor animals, nor the alien within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that's in them, but he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy." He goes on to the next one. Honor your father and your mother so that, your, so that you may live long in the land of the Lord that God has given you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his maidservant or manservant, his ox or donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. So one of the first commands that John is talking about in 1 John would be what they knew was the Ten Commandments because even, even though they were in the New Testament, they knew the Old Testament because at that point they didn't have the New Testament like we have. They only had the law. So they knew the law and they knew that those commandments that God had given them were the law that they were to abide by. So turn over to Deuteronomy chapter 5. And it just reiterates in Deuteronomy chapter 5 the same thing all over again with the Ten Commandments. I'm not going to read it all here because it goes through the same thing again. He just repeats exactly what happened in Exodus chapter 20. But at the end of Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 22, he says, These are the commandments the Lord proclaimed in a loud voice to the whole assembly there on the mountain from out of the fire, the cloud, and the deep darkness. And he added nothing more. Then he wrote them on two stone tablets and gave them to me. This is Moses talking. So there's the commands. When John says there's a new command, but it's actually not new. It's an old command. What he's referring to is the law. And the law could be summed up in the Ten Commandments. But really what the law was summed up in is if you go to Deuteronomy chapter 6, the next place right there, in verse, starting in verse 1, we'll read down here. He says, These are the commands and the decrees and the law that the Lord directed me to teach you and observe in the land that you are crossing the Jordan to possess, so that you and your children and their children, after they may fear the Lord, after, I'm sorry, yeah, after them may fear the Lord as long as they live by keeping all his decrees and commands that I give you, and so that you may enjoy a long life. Who wants to live a long life? Anybody? I want to live a long life. Hear, O Israel, and be careful to obey so that you may go well with, so that it may go well with you and that you may increase greatly in the land flowing with milk and honey, which is, is like vast prosperity, its blessing, its overflow, just as the Lord, the God of your fathers, promised you. And then he says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And then here is how you could summarize all the commands that John's talking about in the Old Testament. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be upon your hearts. I impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road and when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates." And so what Moses is writing here in Deuteronomy to God's people is, look, this is what God has instructed us. And you can summarize everything that he instructed us in one command, which is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and strength. But it's interesting, that's the old command. 
Then Jesus comes into the world in the new command, and he says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself, which we'll get to in a minute when we go back to 1 John. Before we do that, go turn over one more Old Testament passage to Deuteronomy chapter 28. We're just going to go all over the Bible tonight, all right? Deuteronomy 28. And it's interesting, I'm not going to read through all of this because it's long, but in Deuteronomy 28, there was something else that the people of the time when John was writing this would have understand, and that was what was blessing and what was cursing. And so he says in Deuteronomy 28, verse 1, if you fully obey the Lord your God and carefully follow all of his commands I give you today, the Lord your God will set you high above all nations on earth, and all these blessings will come upon you and accompany you if you obey the Lord your God. He goes on and he says, you'll be blessed in the city and blessed in the country. The fruit of your womb will be blessed. Your livestock will be blessed. Your herds will be blessed. Your baskets and your kneading, your, basically your, your food, your provision will be blessed. Uh, you'll be blessed when you come and blessed when you go. That sounds pretty good, right? The Lord will grant that the enemies who rise up against you will be defeated before you. They will come at you from one direction, direction but flee from you in seven, the Lord will send a blessing on your barns and on everything you put your hand to. The Lord will bless you in the land he has given you. He goes on and talks about all the blessing that you receive if you obey his commands. What were his commands? The Ten Commandments and to put him first, right? Ten Commandments, put him first. If you obey and if you live out of obedience, you'll get all this. But the other part they would have understood then was the curse. And if you go down to verse 15, he says, however, if you don't obey the Lord your God and you don't carefully follow all of his commands and the decrees that I'm giving you today, all these curses will come upon you and overtake you. You'll be cursed in the city and cursed in the country. He basically goes on everything he just says and rebuttals it with, if you don't obey God's commands, you won't have the blessing. And so when John's writing in second or first John chapter 2 again, if you want to turn back there, when he says to you, I'm writing you not a new command, but an old one, what he's saying is the old impacts the new. Because the old command was all of the commandments. The old command was love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. The old command was obey and be blessed or disobey and be cursed. And there's truth to that. And we can see in our lives, if you look at the patterns around your life, it doesn't take very long if you realize times you were obedient and the blessing that followed, right? And times you were disobedient and we don't like the word cursing, but the cursing that followed. It's almost like when you were disobedient, a four-letter word follows you, right? Your life just feels like, oh my gosh, like what have I done because I have stepped outside of obedience, but here's what's beautiful about the New Testament and about the gospel is that when he's referring to all these commandments and in verse 7 of 1 John 2 when he says, I'm writing you not about the new, com the new command but an old one, he says, this old command is the message you have heard, which is all the law that you've heard, yet I am writing you a new command. Its truth is seen in him and you because the darkness is passing and the true light is already shining. So what is this new command then that John says, I'm writing you, you know all the old command, okay? You know what it is, but I'm still going to give you a new one. Turn over to John chapter 13. Yep, regular, regular John. <laughs> That's great. Regular John chapter 13, <laughs> verse 44. Or no, 34, I'm sorry. This is Jesus talking and he says, a new command I give you. Love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. What's beautiful about this new command is you can see the reflection of the old command. At the root of everything the Ten Commandments is about really isn't about what it's about, right? Right? Sometimes we look at things and we want to take everything verbatim as it's exactly what it is about. Yes. Uh, sorry, we, uh, John chapter 13. Yep, John chapter 13, verse 34 and 35. But we, we look at this new command and we realize that really the new command summarizes the old command. It doesn't put away the old command, but it sheds light on the old command. Because at the root of the Ten Commandments where he says, don't lie, don't cheat, don't steal, don't covet, right? 
don't, don't curse, honor the Sabbath. The root of all of that was love for God and love for your neighbor. It can all be summarized in those two things. You love God and you love your neighbor. Why don't you go cheating on your spouse? Because that's not loving your spouse, right? Why don't you steal? Because that's not loving the person you're stealing from. The root of everything is a desire, which is John's whole intent for the book of 1 John, is a love of God and a love for others that you can only have when you truly understand God's love. I want you to see one other thing before we move on here. Turn over to Galatians chapter 3, because we read in Deuteronomy 28 about the blessing and the cursing. But there's something really cool about Christ when you understand in his new command what he brings us. If you look at uh, Galatians chapter 3, I gotta find the verse though, because I just thought of it. There we go, 13, verse 13. So Deuteronomy 28 talked about the blessing if you're obedient, but it also talked about the curse. If you're disobedient, but here's what I don't want to leave you guys with tonight is to think that if you have disobeyed, you're cursed because you're not cursed. There's not cursed. What's uh, uh, Galatians chapter three? You can't be cursed because you're under Christ. Look at uh, Galatians chapter three, verse 13. It says, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who's hung on a tree. So he redeemed us in order that the blessing that, he, the blessing that was given to Abraham might come to the Gentiles, which all the blessing was supposed to go to the Jews. But when Christ came, it went to the Gentiles, which means it went to everyone through Christ Jesus so that by faith we might receive the promise of the Spirit. So what's so beautiful about the new commandment that John's talking about is the new commandment is love God, love others, but it also is that we receive all of the blessing and none of the cursing. How cool is that? Like everything that we do, that doesn't mean that when we act out of disobedience, God's just like, I'm gonna bless your disobedience. That doesn't want to mean, that's not what it means. But what it does mean is that when you act out of disobedience, the love of God comes after you so much and can, you cannot, the enemy cannot take you away from God. And what would have happened in the Old Testament is if you were disobedient, you were disconnected from God and the only thing you could ever do to reconcile yourself to God was to follow the rules and regulations and make sacrifices to reconnect yourself to God. But when Christ came and the law, then he fulfilled the law and he shed light on the law. He says, this new command I give you, if you love God and you love others, even when you mess up, because we all fall short, the Bible says, of the glory of God, right? For all the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. We will mess up. We all are sinners. That happens. But the sin no longer can keep us from God because Christ took it on himself so that reconciles us to God. That's crazy. If we had to live on that side of the cross, every time we stubbed our toe and cursed, we'd have to go find an animal and sacrifice it. That's a lot of work, right? Every time you get mad at someone and chew them out and you're like, shoot, I shouldn't have done that, Lord, I'm sorry. That's all we have to say now, right? And God's like, boom, as far as the east is from the west, you're forgiven. In the Old Testament, you'd have to go repent and get reconciled and go to the priest and do all this stuff. Jesus made it so much easier for us to access himself in God. And so what John's getting at here in 1 John chapter 2 is, look, you've been given the greatest thing possible. You get all the blessing and none of the curse. You get all the provision and all the beauty of the law and everything the law talked about that was put in place for you to be blessed and to live healthy lives. And you get connection to a God whose love transforms you and then is poured through you to transform out to others. That's the new command that John is talking about. He's also saying that you see this in Christ but you also see it in you. Turn over to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. I'm going quick, guys, so if you can't get there too, you can listen because I want to give us time to pray and I always prepare way more than I have to prepare. So I'm going to wrap this up in just a minute and we'll just pick up next week. Is that okay? Because I didn't even get to the second half of this message yet. (laughs) No, this is, just, this is just the introduction. All right. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. He says, but you, in verse 4, but you brothers are not in darkness so that the day 
should surprise you like a thief. You are all sons of the light and sons of the day. We do not belong to the night or to the darkness. So then, let us not be like others who are sheep, but let us be alert and self-controlled. Why do we need to be alert and self-controlled? Because we're watching for Christ. We're watching, we're waiting for Christ to come to return to the church. But also, we need to be alert so that we can have the mind of Christ so that everywhere we go, we're living out of the new command, which is love for God and love for others. It's very easy when we get back inside ourselves. We lose sight of our love for God and our love for others. It's very easy when we get caught in darkness. When we're caught in darkness, we're not thinking about what life is like in the light. Because when you're in the darkness, you're blind. And you're like this, you're trying to figure out where you're trying to go and you can't figure out where you're trying to go. And what John is saying here is, look, step back into the light because when you step back into the light, you'll immediately live in this new command that he gives us, which is to love God and to love others. We'll close with this verse tonight. Turn over to John chapter one, regular John. (laughs) Chapter one. Verse 9, it says, The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He, Jesus, was in the world. And though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. God, children born not of natural descent or of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. If you want to summarize all of 1 John chapter 2, 7 through 11, you can summarize it in John, which is the same writer who wrote this, when he says, basically, I'm calling you into the light, which is Christ, so you can live out of love, because I know that many people don't recognize who he is, but if you will recognize him, you will then live out the love that 